this week on the Back Table Podcast. What you're essentially doing is you're um, inserting a foley to where the balloon is uh, beyond the posterior part of the nasal cavity. So it's kind of in the nasopharynx um, at, and you blow it up and then you pull it forward so that the you're, you're putting pressure um, on the back part of the nose um, and then you, um, you're you able to uh, fix it by putting a clamp um, kind of at the front part of the nose, if you can imagine um, what that looks like. If not, then Google it, and I'm sure there'll be a picture of a of a very uncomfortable patient with a foley in their nose. Um, I was going to say, I thought I thought NG tubes were bad. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is not well tolerated. I think it is okay if you are desperate to just get some control so that you can um, kind of get ahead of the situation and make a plan. You know, it's going to keep um, blood from going down their throat, and it's going to um, kind of allow you to temporize things. everyone and welcome to the Back Table Podcast. This is Gopi Shah as your guest host. I'm very excited to introduce our guest today, Dr. Sabine Dond, an interventional radiologist from PIH Health in LA, and my good friend and ENT colleague, Dr. Ashley Agan from UT Southwestern here in Dallas. Welcome, guys. Before we dive into our topic today, just wanted to say a quick word from our sponsor, RadPad. RadPad was developed by physicians for physicians, clinically proven radiation protection during CINE and digital subtraction angiography. Don't bet your career or your health on anything less. Trust RadPad radiation protection shields for all of your fluoro-guided interventions. See radpad.com for more information. Contact info at radpad.com for a free radiation evaluation and a no-brainer radiation protection cap. And let them know you heard, it, heard about it on Backtable Podcasts. Sabine, do you guys use anything special for radiation protection, or do you use the RadPad materials? You know, uh, we've been considering using RadPad right now, just kind of standard radiation protection with the shields that we have. Um, we even looked into that zero-gravity system, too, but, but we really like the RadPad, and I think we're going to incorporate it within the next couple of months. Cool. Dr. Agan, do you ever use any radiation protection for anything that uh, ENT that you do? You know, um, I do not. Uh, fortunately, fortunately, I do not need any um, uh, radiation protection for any of my procedures or <laughs> daily activities. Mm -hmm. We just <laughs> hide behind the wall. That's right. Okay. <laughs> All right. So um, I just wanted to start out with some introductions. Um, maybe you guys can each tell us about your practice and location. Uh, maybe Dr. Don, if you wanted to first tell us about your practice and location. Oh, definitely, definitely. Well, thank you for the introduction. Yeah, I'm one of the IRs at PIH Health. It's in Whittier, California, which is, you know, about 20 miles from LA. It's, uh, I'm one of six IRs, and we basically do both peripheral and neuroendovascular work. And uh, primarily the neuroendovascular work for me is uh, stroke intervention. But by uh, learning a lot of above the neck uh, interventions, I do a lot of external carotid work, so, you know, aside from what we're going to be talking about today, uh, like uh, embolization for epistaxis, uh, we do a lot of pre-op meningioma embolizations and, and um, you know, kind of arteriovenous malformations of the face. So I'm really excited to talk to you guys today and, and kind of really learn from the ENT standpoint of epistaxis. So, you know, thanks to Backtable for having me and I'm looking forward to this conversation. Awesome. And Dr. Agan, tell us about your practice and location. Hi, uh, my name is Ashley Agan, and I'm a general otolaryngologist um, here in Dallas, and I'm practicing in an academic setting at UT Southwestern. I've been in practice here for about three years now. I did my training here at UT Southwestern as well. I um, am a true general otolaryngologist without any subspecialty, so I still see the full array of ENT problems um, in all age groups um, and treat um, quite a bit of epistaxis. So um, I'm excited to, um, to discuss it with you guys today. All right. Well, so I was thinking, you know, we want to just kind of talk about how epistaxis presents in your practice um, through the ER, inpatient, consult. Um, I think 
because ENT probably sees uh, an initial complaint about epistaxis more, um, I was figured, you know, Dr. Agan, Ashley, you could tell us about how it presents to you. Sure. Yeah. So I, I see, um, I see a lot of epistaxis in, in kids. Um, it's a consultation in clinic where there, you know, there's a report that they've had some episodes of epistaxis and frequently the parents are very concerned because it, maybe it lasted a few minutes, um, um, but stopped on its own with pressure. And, and, um, in this population of kids, usually they, they have, um, some prominent anterior septal vessels that they're, they're getting dried and crusted and they're picking at it. And so they're having recurrent bleeds. Um, I'll also, um, another common one is, um, older patients who are on blood thinners. Um, so Coumadin, Plavix, um, those patients will have nosebleeds, sometimes for the same reason. Sometimes they're also um, picking in their noses or aggressively blowing their noses during uh, allergy season, and um, they're, they'll have uh, bleeding as well that just lasts longer since they're um, on anticoagulation. I would say less often I'll have the patient that is actively bleeding in my office. So, um, for example, someone who's already one of my patients will call the nurse and say that they're having a nosebleed that that they're not able to stop at home and we'll have them come into the office, um, which I think is, is a better place to treat a nosebleed than in the emergency room because I have my scopes and suction and um, kind of all my tools that I can use to treat that active bleeding in the office. Um, and then I would say now that I'm not a resident anymore, the most com- you know, the, um, the patient in the ER with the nosebleed is the least common scenario for me at this time. As a resident, I would say that was probably the most common scenario. Um, patients who come into the emergency room and are having nosebleeds that they weren't able to stop at home. And um, Dr. Don Sabine, um, how do you usually, how does epistaxis uh, present to you in your practice? Yeah, like uh, like how you were saying. I mean, it's generally the, the the epistaxis will be an inpatient request, and it'll be something that has been coming from the ENT. So you know, it's almost like an analogy that you know, in, in IR, a GI bleed. You know, they usually consult GI first, and then comes to us. So it's very similar in this scenario that uh, ENT is consulted first, and usually does. You know, this is this is for management of small cases of bleeds that need, you know, more aggressive management. And usually the ENTs are so good, they don't need us. So um, it does come sometimes where either they're unavailable or, you know, um, or, you know, they want us to do the embolization and, and we're happy to. So that's kind of how we get all our consults for Episac. Have you ever been consulted directly from the ER? Before ENT, has that ever happened or? Not really. I mean, there's been times when they've consulted both of us, but to be honest, most physicians um, that aren't ENT don't really even know that, um, you know, embolization is is a treatment option for epistaxis. And, um, you know, because it's just, it's, it's pretty, you know, it's not the most common thing to do. And so it's not really their fault. Yeah. Um, do you guys feel, or Ash, do you feel like there are, uh, certain types of nosebleeds like anterior versus posterior nosebleeds? You know, we tend to kind of, um, you know, d- classify them as anterior and posterior depending on their anatomy. Do you feel like that there are some that are more relevant for ENT versus, uh, ENT and IR or just IR? Um, I would say from my standpoint, um, an anterior nosebleed, uh, it can be easier to treat because it's just easier to access. You know, it's right there in the front of the nose. Um, uh, a lot of times the, the patient themselves can stop it with holding pressure, um, using Afrin. Um, but uh, even with posterior nosebleeds, um, if you have scopes and suction and the ability to, to look back in the nose and see where the bleeding is coming from, um, then I think usually... Um, we can still take care of it. Ashley, do you get, do they, do you have the scopes available in the emergency room if they call you there? Sort of. So um, the, we can get scopes from the operating room um, with varying levels of ease. So, you know, if it's, if it's the middle of the day and the normal people are there and we say that we need some, um, you know, a, a rigid scope, 
then they know where to go get it and they can get it for us. You know, that's where it's like a pill packed, like single scope and not a whole set for surgery. Um, but if it's the middle of the night, uh, when most people come in and when you need it most, usually Mm -hmm. it's nowhere to be found or they don't know what you're talking about, you know? So it's, it just depends sometimes. So, um, Ashley, when you have a patient with a nosebleed, do you have like a treatment algorithm that you go through or what, how do you usually manage it? Um, sure. So usually we tell patients, um, to hold pressure, to use Afrin, which is a, you know, decongestant nasal spray that, um, constricts the blood vessels. Um, if, um, if, if, and we tell them to hold pressure without peaking. So we'll tell them to, you know, hold pressure, um, over the bridge of their nose, um, uh, for let's say 10 to 15 minutes without peaking to really give it a chance to, um, to stop. Um, if they're still having significant bleeding, then we tell them to, you know, come in and meet us in the ER or come into clinic and see me. Um, in the emergency room, um, there are some, um, ER physicians who feel perfectly comfortable, you know, placing packing, placing a rhino rocket, which is like a, um, a type of nasal packing, um, where you can, um, inflate, um, some air into it. So it causes, it can exert some pressure against those, um, blood vessels. Um, and sometimes, um, they give us a call and and we can come in and, um, put some packing in there. Just kind of depends. Okay. And if, um, when, if the packing doesn't work, what, what do you normally, what's in your practice the next step? Um, if packing doesn't work, um, you have to kind of, um, start breaking down why things aren't working out. And so, um, you know, looking at the patient as a whole, you know, what's, what's going on? Is their blood pressure, you know, 200 systolic? And we want to make sure that you have help um, getting that down. Um, if they're, um, uh, over anticoagulated and their INR is really high, you want to make sure that you have, um, help with that as well, things like that. So getting those factors under control. Um, one of the common, uh, mistakes with, with packing. If you don't have the ability to really look in the nose, or if you're just not familiar with the nasal anatomy is to not fully insert the packing into the nose. So, you know, when you look at your nose, you kind of see the surface of your nose. Um, but there's so much more to your nose than what you're able to see. You know, the nose goes all the way back, um, to kind of like the where your ear would be if you're looking at it from the side uh, or to the back of where your palate is if you're looking through your mouth. So there's a lot of space in the nasal cavity. So um, sometimes I'll have patients who have, quote, failed uh, placement of uh, like a rhino rocket, but you they you go to see them in the emergency room and most of the rhino rocket is hanging outside of their nose because it hasn't actually been all the way inserted. So um, so it, it may just, maybe you didn't get a good attempt um, and, uh, I think another thing, another pitfall, um, is, um, when placing packing in the nose, it's easy to excoriate the mucosa and cause more bleeding. If you aren't able to really see, um, what you're doing and just target the area that's bleeding. I've definitely seen that a lot as well. And then you're dealing with multiple, multiple places that aren't bleeding. Um, you know, when, um, when patients, um, have had appropriate packing, um, and you've, you know, evaluated their nose and you can see where it's bleeding from and you feel like you're getting good packing, but they continue to have, um, uh, bleeding, then, then we start talking about like, let's, let's go to the operating room and get a better exam. And, and some patients, um, they just don't tolerate, um, a, a good endoscopic exam when they're awake. Um, if they have blood running down the back of their throat, then they're gagging and choking. Um, they, you know, sometimes they're irritable because they've been up all night and in the emergency room and they, you're, you know, trying to stick a scope in their nose. And so sometimes you just can't get the exam that you need um, with them awake. Um, and so then, you know, I think um, going to the operating room and looking with a scope and then addressing any bleeding that you're seeing is is the next uh, option. That's the next thing that would be in my algorithm. Yeah, no, I think you're right. I, like you said, the nose, it's surprising when, you know, we scope a patient in clinic and they're like, oh my God, there's so much room. There, it goes, the nasal cavity goes so far back. So it's one thing when it's uh, an anterior nosebleed and it's just on the front part of the septum and you can cauterize that or cauterize the turbinate head or something. But 
when it's further back, it's definitely harder to do. Um, so let's say you're in the OR. Um, usually when you're in the OR for a nosebleed, do you feel like um, you're able to identify the area and then kind of section? How do you normally manage yeah. it in the OR? Yeah, I would say the the vast majority of the time um, I can rinse the nose out with saline, get everything kind of nice and cleaned up and isolate the spot that is bleeding. Um, if they've had a lot of packing in their nose and the mucosa is um, kind of um, roughed up from all the packing, then that can make it a little bit more difficult because it's bleeding from almost everywhere. Um, but um, but usually, I would say, you know, 90 plus percent of the time, um, you can go in and find where it's bleeding from, cauterize it with a suction boby. Um, I'll usually put um, a little bit of absorbable packing um, in the area as well, just to have um, some extra... I don't know, like backup, uh, just in case. Um, and, um, and usually that's it. Yeah. So sometimes, you know, we kind of, uh, you know, we're all taught about these posterior nosebleeds and, you know, having to insert a Foley back there and blow it up to stop Mm -hmm. these nosebleeds. Do you ever, uh, can you tell us a little bit more about the posterior nosebleeds and then, you know, the, you know, sphenopalatine artery ligation, um, sure. I think, um, you know, using a Foley um, for posterior nosebleeds is something that is helpful in the um, acute setting. It, I think it kind of temporizes things. And what you're essentially doing is you're um, inserting a Foley to where the balloon is uh, beyond the posterior part of the nasal cavity. So it's kind of in the nasopharynx. Um, at, and you blow it up and then you pull it forward so that the, you're, you're putting pressure, um, on the back part of the nose. Um, and then you, um, you're able to, uh, fix it by putting a clamp, um, kind of at the front part of the nose. If you can imagine, um, what that looks like, if not, then Google it. And I'm sure there'll be a picture of a, of a very uncomfortable patient with a Foley in their nose. Um, I was going to say, I thought, I thought NG tubes were bad. <laughs> it, it is not well tolerated. I think it is okay if you are desperate to just get some control so that you can um, kind of get ahead of the situation and make a plan, you know, it's going to keep um, blood from going down their throat and it's going to um, kind of allow you to temporize things. There is a, it's a rare instance when you would need to have a patient keep a Foley in, I, I would say. And then as far as SPA ligation goes, you're um, essentially going in, um, doing a maxillary entrostomy um, to you're, you're opening up um, the, the cheek sinus, the maxillary sinus, um, and then you um, elevate the mucosa and find where the sphenopalatine artery is um, exiting at the back wall, uh, the back maxillary wall of the maxillary sinus. Yeah. Um, and sometimes there's multiple branches that come off and I feel like, you know, you kind of flick that bone off and would, try to clip would you consider you that? Would it, would you consider it like a straightforward procedure? Is it like if you haven't done it for a while, it would be, you I know, think if you do sinus surgery routinely, I don't think it's hard. Yeah. yeah um, I would, I would say it's pretty straightforward. It, it might, I mean, it, I mean, always when you haven't done anything in a while, I would say you, you're a little bit, um, yeah. you know, nervous about it, but, but as far as the techniques, it, it's pretty similar to sinus surgery. So you're just, um, uh, yeah. So Ash, when do you, um, when would you ever consult, um, IR for like an embolization in addition to what you've done or instead of what you're doing? Um, so if, um, if you just can't, if you've done all those things and can't get control or, um, if you are in the operating room and you can't, there's so much bleeding and it's so brisk that you just can't see and you can't safely control the bleeding because you can't see. Yeah. And, and another, you know, um, another presentation, um, that sometimes looks like epistaxis is, um, patients who have carotid blowouts, who have, um, who have a history of head and neck mm-hmm. cancer, who've had radiation. I've had those patients come in and the ER calls us for what is, is you know, sounds like a nosebleed. And then you see them and you're like, oh, I, I, you know, this patient, it's a, it's a different kind of patient history. Um, and, um, I think, 
those, you know, it, it may be indicated to talk to IR first, even about those types of patients. So Sabine, when you um, get a, you know, call about a nosebleed, hey, we need IR, you know, to come in and take care of this. Uh, what kind of questions do you usually ask the referring doc? Um, when you, you know, what's going through your mind initially? Yeah, I mean, like, just like Ashley described, I mean, these all all those um, <clears throat> procedures that that are done are really effective. So, you know, by the time they call us, it's something a little bit more frantic, or you know, they're just like, "Look, we just can't control it." And again, like I said, ninety nine. I can only remember one consult one time that was from the ER that wasn't directly from ENT, but you know, it's it's the ENT doc saying, "Okay." Um, you know, is there, is, is there anything you can do? You think embolization will work? And, you know, it's, it's like, sure, you know, we can, we can definitely give it a try. And, and um, uh, there's, you know, they've already gone through the whole workup and everything. So as far as questions, I, I really ask is, has it been done before? Um, you know, and then I'll kind of tell you why in the technique, like describing the technique, because I could change the technique or if they've had any major surgery to the face, uh, that could pretty much change um, your approach or even the complications. I also just ask, is there, if it's not ENT calling me, I'll ask, like, is ENT on board? So that right. they're, they're there. Right. Are there any contraindications for embolization? You talked a little bit about uh, surgery to the face. Yeah. Um, you know, the surgery to the face is not a contraindication. There is a contraindication that comes up during the angiogram. And then that's really the only um, contraindication and, and I can, you know, you know, I can talk about the technique uh, if you want and, and then kind of, because that's really the only contraindications when we find an artery or a connection to an artery in the procedure. So if you want, I can go into the technique. Yeah, that'd be uh, great. You can tell it. us. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, you know, so, you know, uh, we've been talking about the sphenopalatine artery and, and that's what's really supplying most of the nose. Um, but you know, the nose, like from the, from the angiographic standpoint, it's also supplied by the internal carotid artery. So, um, there's branches of the ophthalmic artery that go, the ethmoidal branches go down there. And then also, uh, there are a lot of anastomoses between external carotid artery and internal carotid artery. So, and by anastomoses, I mean, there's connections. So, um, one of the most common ones is not that common, but we can see, is the internal, ophthal- or sorry, the ophthalmic artery coming off the external carotid artery. So hmm. the reason I talk about these is because the sphenopalatine artery, when we go for that for angiogram, that's coming off the external um, carotid artery. And that's generally the safe artery to kind of do anything, do embolizations, but you don't want any beads to go into the internal carotid artery wow. or into the eye because right. you can cause blindness or stroke. So really that's, that's kind of the basis of, of, of the entire technique of doing the procedure. You know, we do it as a standard angiogram. All the ones I've gone, I've gone through the groin. You could go through the radial here, you know, as, as there is mm-hmm. a, um, a big movement to go radial. But, um, you know, it's, it might be a little bit hard uh, because the external carotid artery is a little bit smaller. So, you know, radial could make it actually tougher. From the groin, it's pretty easy. It's a straight shot unless you have a tough aorta. And, um, you know, I always, I always promote stable access using like a guiding catheter, like a benchmark. Um, you've got to be, you got to be careful above the neck. So it's, you know, it's always a closed system with bubble uh, precautions. And, you know, you really, the one thing about this procedure is stroke. It's not, you definitely don't want to cause a stroke when trying to manage this bleeding. So, um, you can't really treat it like in the periphery when we just put a five French catheter and a micro catheter through it. You want to have a continuous flush and be really careful about bubbles. And to look for those anastomoses, we'll always do an internal carotid artery run at first. And, and what I'm looking for, really the first thing I look for when I when I do an angiogram of the ICA is I just want to look for that, that retinal blush. Basically, you can mm-hmm. see the eyeball light up and then you know that the ophthalmic artery is coming off the ICA. You're kind of, you feel a little bit more comfortable and, and to go forward with the procedure. But you also look, like Ashley mentioned, you look for any kind of pseudoaneurysm or something off the ICA that can be causing a bleed. So those are the type of things you're looking for. You can look for those ethmoidal branches supplying the roof of the nose. Sometimes they're really, they're, they're kind of hypertrophied and they're blushing a lot more. 
and you know that those are bleeding, but you wouldn't go into those and embolize. You would just say, look, this is not, this is a contraindication. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm-hmm. No, I was just going to say the ethmoid, the anterior ethmoid artery, sometimes we, we can, you know, we can look from inside the nose, buzz it or clip it. Um, yeah, see, that's much more safer Yeah, because if we put our catheter in there and, and one or two particles just go in, I mean, that the patient can become blind. So yeah. it's definitely way safer from, from the surgical standpoint. Um, yeah, then, you know, the, the ECA, the, the anatomy, you know, we kind of always learn it in med school. We name the branches of the external carotid artery. They look just like that on angio. And you really, the internal maxillary artery always has this kind of hairpin turn. And the sphenopalatine artery is just distal to that. So we're just looking, you know, again, all the time looking for that retinal blush, making sure that the eye is not coming, perfusion to the eye is not coming off of there. And then we just embolize from there. And how, we, how often do you see an ophthalmic artery and acidosis between the ICA and ECA? It's, is that, it's is that common? You know what? Um, I have not seen one in practice, actually. But, you know, it's it's always something you're warned about, and I've seen them in textbooks. Mm-hmm. Um, the rate that they say is, is, is it's it's pretty low, um, but uh, it's not – but it's something – it's it's just disastrous if, if you miss it, and, and obviously a legal issue if you miss it too. So, um, you know, we're always just looking for it, and it's pretty and easy to see once – if you're looking for it. What uh, are there uh – embolization materials do you use for yeah we i I use particles and and most people use particles and um generally i use like around the the size i go is like 100 to 300 and you know no they usually say under 100 is a bad idea because while you're embolizing you might open up some other anastomoses so those can be really small so something under 100 can can you know potentially go through these anastomoses you don't want that um, and then usually after I'll put like a little, like tor- a gel phone torpedo, uh, through the microcatheter and it'll just sit into the internal maxillary artery. <clears throat> Some people put coils, but you know, coils are permanent. And if they bleed again, then you kind of block your entry. Uh, you totally can do it. But in someone who has something like, I don't know, like HHT or something like that, you, you they may bleed again. You really don't want to use coils. Okay. Um, yeah, and then, you know, we'll look at the face. Sometimes the facial artery supplies <clears throat> a majority of, of where it's bleeding. So we'll look at that, too, and you can embolize that, too, just, again, being careful. But I would say the only contraindication to um, embolization after all of this has been performed is just that very scary risk of stroke. So you look for those arteries. Um, so, Ashley, what, can you just tell us some pearls or, and or pitfalls of ENT treatments for epistaxis? Um, sure. Um, I, I would say, you know, obviously, like I said before, the go-to is pressure, holding pressure, <laughs> hold pressure, hold pressure. Um, yeah, Afrin um, can be helpful. Um, warm saline um, can be helpful. Something that that I've learned kind of as as I go along is is being able to see and to really treat that focal area of bleeding um, is so much better than kind of blindly shoving, you know, Surgicil or Fibrilar or, you know, pick your packing of choice um, into the nose because um, I've definitely, you know, treated patients who have been, who have been packed elsewhere who continue to have bleeding. And, and, and when I kind of on, you know, clean up everything. They, the, some of the spots that they're bleeding from are because of the, the aggressive nature of, um, packing the nose. It's just that the mucosa is very delicate and, and, um, you can cause more problems. Um, and, um, and, you know, like we talked about with the, with the rhino rocket, you have to, um, make sure that those are fully inserted in the nose and you can actually cause alar necrosis if you've got a rhino rocket that's inflated it's not fully in the nose and putting pressure um, on the nasal ala. Um, and we've seen that too. So um, if you if you feel comfortable um, placing a rhino rocket, you want to just make sure that you're pushing it back the nose and not up the nose. And um, you want to make sure that it's um, fully inserted into the nose so it's not putting any pressure um, on the nasal ala. Yeah, I like, yeah, I like what, you know, in terms of being able to see is key. If there's a lot of clots in the nose. I, I like to section them out. People always kind of say if there's clots in there, leave them. But 
Lots of ooze too. So if you can get it out, you can see that's key. Um, I feel like in kids, we do tend to do a lot more of the dissolvable packing. They don't tolerate the rockets and the mirror cell uh, very well. So we'll tend to do some surge cell, gel foam, uh, flow seal type stuff. And, you know, um, I think the underlying cause is very important. Um, and then Sabine, what about some pearls and pitfalls for um, IR treatment of epistaxis? Yeah, you know, uh, kind of, again, the pearl, I mean, the main thing I would say about this procedure that some people don't, you know, if, if they don't do these or are, are not familiar, you know, you, you just, you have to look for those um, external to internal carotid artery anastomoses. And, and um, as long as you keep an eye out for that, then you can avoid that, that big risk of stroke. And, uh, you know, in, in embolization, you know, we'll see transient, um, like pain or headaches or swelling that that's kind of common. And I kind of warn my patients about that before, you know, they even can have, uh, you know, there's, there's one of my patients had jaw claudication for a couple of days after. So, you know, there's kind of these oddball scenarios that happen because you are embolizing arteries, you know, both side and bilateral arteries of the face. So, um, you know, bad things can happen too. You right. know, aside from stroke, you can have skin or nasal necrosis. You can have facial nerve paralysis. So it's not a benign procedure by far. And, and that's why, you know, I do think, you know, with this with the algorithm that we kind of touched on, I, I do think approaching it from, you know, pressure packing and then ENT endoscopically um, is better first. And I do think embolization is, is almost like a, not really a last line, but just an additional way that we can help. It's really great that we can talk to different specialties. I mean, it's very infrequent that ENTs and IRs talk together in any conference or anything like that. So I really like this ability to um, approach conditions and care in a, in a multidisciplinary approach. So um, great job, guys. That sounds great. Thank you guys so much for being on the Back Table podcast today about this very exciting topic. <laughs> so much. I learned a ton. Thank you, Sabine. Yeah, um, me thank too. you, Ashley. Um, uh, we also want to thank our sponsor, Radpad. Um, and thank you for being with us today. We'll talk to you next time on Back Table Podcast.